Suspense, which is usually heard at this hour on Thursday nights, is taking its customary summer holiday. Suspense returns to the air three weeks from tonight on Thursday, September 1st. You are with three men on a jungle plantation on the rubber coast of Borneo. You know that one of the men is a desperate criminal whom you've come to arrest, but you don't know which one. You have to find him before he can save himself by killing you. We offer you Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to a Borneo jungle in a tantalizing search for a murderer, as L.G. Blockman told it in his famous story, Red Wine. As the rusty little tramp freighter bumped against the rickety wharf, I dropped from the rail onto the planking and for the first time felt the humid heat roll out of the jungle like steam from the back door of a Turkish bath. I'd come a long way. Six days before, I'd stepped off a float in San Francisco Bay, climbed aboard a Pan American clipper headed for the South Pacific. Two days later, I'd boarded the mailboat in Batavia. And now, Tanyong Samar, sweltering and half-forgotten, last outpost on the rubber coast of Borneo. Yes, a long journey. But here would now mark the end of it. I'd come to arrest a murderer. I crossed the beach and walked up the path of crushed shells leading to a low bungalow at the edge of the jungle. The freighter would lie at the wharf for four hours. Plenty of time for me to get the thing over with and be back aboard when she sailed. I was expecting danger, of course, but no real trouble. I'd done jobs like this before, so I stepped confidently up on the porch and met Herr Kurt, controller of the Tanyang Samar district. Yeah, yeah, I am Herr Kurt, the controller. What is it I can do for you? I have a letter of introduction here from the governor general. Um, uh, here, here you are. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Paul Vanier from the United States. Uh, the governor promised me your cooperation. So I see. Cooperation. That's good. But he doesn't say cooperation in what? Well, I've come here after a killer, Mr. Kurt. Oh, Dayaks, maybe? Headhunters? No, no, this one's a civilized killer, an American. Wanted in San Francisco for murdering his wife. His name is Jerome Steeks. Oh, I see. Won't you sit down, Mr. Vanier? Yes, thank you. Won't come? Buy a coffee. That's one, Mr. I bring right away. We will have coffee in a moment. Oh, that's nice of you, but... Uh... Maybe I'd better pick this guy up first. I'd hate to miss the boat and have to lay over five days. You are acquainted with this, Teeks, Mr. Veneer? No, no, I've never seen him. But you do have photographs. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. This was a very clever killer. He apparently took great pains to see that he was never photographed. He carefully eliminated all the fingerprints as well. What are you driving at, Mr. Kirk? Well, simply this. There is no one in my district by the name of Steeks. Oh, no, of course not. He wouldn't be using his own name. There is an American here, though, isn't there? Three of them, Mr. Vanier. Employed as foreman on the Cotter rubber plantation. Well, according to my information, Steeks came here from Batavia about six months ago. We all arrived six months ago on the same boat. The Cotter company is just going back into operation. I see. Well, according to the people who've seen him, Jerome Steeks is a man about 35 years old, of medium height and slight build, pale complexion with black hair and mustache. Amazing. Any one of these men might fit the description, except that all are clean-shaven and heavily tanned from tropical sun. Furthermore, Mr. Veneer, all three of the men have light blonde hair. A copy should have seen it, one, sir. Uh, good. Pour out two cups, Wong. I'll have Wong bring your baggage up from the wharf, Mr. Veneer. Yeah, thank you, Wong. It appears your business may take a little longer than four hours. Uh, I, I'm certain of the information I got in Batavia. I know the man's here. Then the problem resolves itself into a matter of identification. Bully pick is a car on. No, an hour's talk with the three of them ought to do that. I doubt it, Mr. Veneer. 
The swamps here at Tanjong Samara are infested with fever. It's always hot, like now. And the jungles back there swarm with long-tailed true snakes and deadly cobras. In the rivers, crocodiles. So? Men rarely come here unless they're running away from something, trying to lose their past. I think you'll find all three men have manufactured stories. So, how is one to choose? Well, I, um... Uh, moreover, according to this letter, I'm authorized by the governor to assist you in arresting and extraditing Jerome Steaks. One man, not three. Hmm. So it's up to me, huh? Oh, do not misunderstand me, Mr. Vanier. I will cooperate with you in every way. But I think it will be a very hard thing to identify this man you have never seen when he doesn't wish to be identified. I don't know. Sometimes it's easier to identify a man from his personality than from his physical appearance. And the personality of this man Steaks is something out of the ordinary? Yeah, for a foreman on a rubber plantation, yes. Yeah, I doubt if all three of these men can be aristocrats. And in a sense, that's what Steaks is, a cosmopolitan. Lived all over the world, always associating with top society. He's a lover of fine foods and wine, speaks French and German fluently. He's a gourmet, a bon vivant, a man of perfect taste in clothes and manners. And a murderer. Yes, and a murderer. When the three men return from the clearing this evening, I shall be happy to introduce you to them, though it's quite probable they are aware of your identity already. What do you mean? Jungle grapevine. Before you stepped off the wharf, my houseboat told me... Uh, that you were a detective. Undoubtedly, the same information has reached the clearings by now. I see. So, in other words, the murderer probably knows who I am and what I'm here for. But I haven't the slightest idea who he is, huh? Exactly. It's quite an interesting thought, isn't it? More coffee, Mr. Veneer? <laughs> Mr. Veneer? I would like you to meet Mr. Doran. Hi, Mr. Mr. Doran. And this is Mr. Wilmerding. Pleasure, Mr. Veneer. I'll save you the trouble, Kurt. My name's Prale. Glad to meet you. Uh, Same here, Mr. Prale. Uh, You might as well drop that mister. We don't use it much around here. I'm Prale, that's Doran, and Wilmerding, and you're Veneer, if it's all the same to you. Uh, Sure, sure, Prale. Why not? Now, if you gentlemen will excuse me, I have a number of things to do. Bring Mr. Veneer to my bungalow for dinner. We'll celebrate having a guest at Tanjong Samar. Oh, sure. Okay. We'll see you. Sure. Well, uh, Herr Kurt tells me all three of you are Americans. Well, I don't know whether I'm still one or not. Haven't been to the States in seven years. Uh, seven years, huh? Then you're an old-timer here, Duran. Oh, not here, Australian. Oh, don't let Duran get started, Veneer. He'll spend two hours telling you how he lost his shirt trying to raise sheep down under. Well, if I had either money or sense, I wouldn't have come to this stinking home. Oh, I wouldn't say you fellas had it too rough. Been noticing those empty bottles there on the shelf. What do you mean, Vernier? Well, here, Piper Heidsick, 1936. That's good champagne. <laughs> you boys are living like gourmets, connoisseurs. Oh, you're overrating us, Vernier. Those empty bottles were already here when he came. Just never got around to throwing them out. Prale here is the only connoisseur in the bunch. He can tell you anything you want to know about wine. Yeah. Or about anything. Oh, dry up. Just because a guy happens to know a little more than somebody else, there's no reason to keep riding him all the time. Uh, I wish you knew some way to make ice. I'm getting plenty fed up with warm beer day in, day out. Yes, that would get pretty tiresome. I think I'd switch to Chambertin or Chablis or something. Hmm? Come again? <laughs> well, Wilmerding, I didn't necessarily mean those in particular, but there are quite a number of wines that are even better warm than they are chilled. Uh, you're in the wrong place, chum. We wouldn't know what to do with them if we had them. This is strictly a beer and gin crowd. Yeah, there'd be no kick on that if we had some ice to go with it. Oh, what I wouldn't give for a cold, frosty... Oh, relax, oh. Wilmer Dane. You make me thirsty. Oh. What, do you, what do you say to some music, huh? Oh, music? Does uh, one of you play some instrument? Sure, sure, Prale. He's terrific on that phonograph over there in the corner. <laughs> Only trouble is, he thinks three o'clock in the morning is the greatest song ever written. <laughs> well, I can see that leading to quite an argument, Duran, particularly if uh, you're a lover of the classics. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't go for that long hair stuff. But I would like to hear a fast number once in a while. It's less than ten years old. Yeah, you ought to see this collection Prale dragged up here from Batavia. Strictly from the gay 90s. Uh, Prale, uh, you don't by any chance have a number called Ilia Ometrie dans cette maison? What's that, some Italian opera? Uh, No, no, it's French, approximately. Well, come on, Prale. Translate it for us. You claim to be an expert on the French language. Well, it's worded kind of 
Funny, it's like poetry. Oh, sure, sure. That last word, though, that maison, that, that means house. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's too bad. I thought maybe Jerome Steaks might translate it. Huh? It refers to him, of course. Steaks? What are you talking about? A sentence reads, There's a murderer in this house. Well... So you're finally coming out in the open, huh? Yeah, we heard you were a detective. Yeah, that's right. So what about it, Steaks? You want to give up now or try to go on with your act? Wait a second, Vernier. I get it now. You're after some killer you've never seen named Steaks, and you figure one of us is it, huh? Yeah, that's right, Prale. Then the guy you're after is Wilmerding. Are you crazy? Who ever heard anybody with a name like Wilmerding unless they made it up? Made up nothing. I got a passport to prove it. What are you trying to do, Prale? Turn attention away from yourself? I got nothing to hide. It's either you or Durant. What? Listen, you can leave me out of this right now. There's plenty of people in Australia that can tell you who I am. Unfortunately, though, there's nobody in Tanyong Samar who can tell me for certain who any of you are. But one of you is a murderer. And by the time the boat gets back here, since I'm obviously not going to be able to leave with it when it sails in an hour, I'll know which one. Now, either I'm going to take Jerome Steaks back to San Francisco with me... Or I'm going to kill him trying to. You can count on it. Well, what do you say we go on over to Kurt's bungalow and have dinner? That's uh, Wilmerding's room there. Doran sleeps here. And pray on down at the end. Oh, yes. And this is the guest room. At least the only guest room that's un, uh, usable at the present. Yeah, it looks all right. Well, it's used for the time you're here, Mr. Vanier. Uh, do uh, all of these rooms open out under the porch? Yes, the veranda, as we call it. And there's no way to lock this door, I suppose. Unfortunately, no. And anyway, uh, the windows are covered only by mosquito netting. It makes another interesting situation, does it not? Yeah, I suppose interesting is the word for it. I assume, Mr. Vanier, that you have not been able to identify your man by his personality. No, whichever one is Steaks is putting on an awfully good act. Most likely they're all acting to a greater or lesser extent, which, of course, makes your problem exceedingly difficult. Yeah, that's right, Mr. Kidd. Uh, you did say a man rarely came here unless he wanted to lose his past. And yet, you're here. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. But then... I am only a servant of the government and have little choice where I am sent. Well, good night, Mr. Vanier. I sat there in the lamplight for a long time after Kurt left, trying to figure things out and getting nowhere. Gradually, the night breeze brought the smell of the jungle into the room. Rich, exotic, fragrant as a midnight orchid, as disturbing as the scent of danger. Or maybe... Maybe it was danger itself I was smelling. The heavy knife missed my throat by two inches, fell it into a bamboo partition and stuck there, quivering. I dropped down on the floor and slid my thirty-eight out of its holster. I could hear nothing but the rustle of palm thatch along the eaves, low creaks from the pilings underneath the bungalow, and the soft night sounds from the jungle. Finally, I slipped my shoes off, pulled the knife out of the wall and dropped it in my pocket. Moved to the door and stepped quietly out into the veranda. It was empty. Across the railing, the fringe of undergrowth was dappled in silver moonlight. And nothing moved. I paused quickly at the three doors and from each heard the sound of snoring. One of the men was faking, but which one? I'd reached the end of the porch when my eye caught a slight movement in a banana clump a few yards from the steps. Someone was hiding there. I moved swiftly, holding the gun ready and came within a few feet before I could make out a shape in red and white sarong. And shape was right, complete with dark, tumbled curls and a flower behind one ear. It was a girl. Please, Tuan, the gun. You are going to shoot me? No, 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 relax, honey. I was looking for somebody else. And now you have found Nilana, so, so you are disappointed? Ah, uh -huh, pleasantly surprised. Nilana, huh? In your language, it means... Flower of love. It's a perfect fit. Are you uh, blooming out here all alone? I do not understand, Tuan. Uh, I mean, did you see anybody moving around up there on the veranda a while ago? Only you, Tuan. I became frightened and ran to hide. Frightened? Why? I should not be here. 
At night, I mean. I uh, Let us talk of something else. <laughs> All right, Nalana. The moon, for instance? Oh, yes. Look, is it not big and soft? and warm. Yeah, all of that. Tuan, you like Nilana, perhaps? Definitely. Why do we not go somewhere else? Along the beach, perhaps? You would like that? Well, I'm I... I'm afraid am... Mr. Oh. Veneer is too serious-minded for such things, Nilana. Veneer! Well, Mr. Kert, uh, join us, won't you? Thank you. Nilana, go to the bungalow at once. Yes, Veneer, I go. I, I go immediately. She has no business being out alone at night. But, Mr. Veneer, is something wrong with your room? Is it not comfortable? It was, until this flew in through the window. A knife? Yeah, a throwing knife. You ever see it before? Oh, yeah, yeah. It is one of the collection there in the bungalow. The three Americans throw them at targets every evening and wager on the results. I believe Mr. Durant taught the other two. Yeah, what about you, Mr. Kurt? Do you ever bet with them? It would be too easy. Watch. Yeah. I learned to throw a knife in Java many years ago. And uh, Nalana, I suppose she's an expert at it, too. Nalana knows nothing of knives. Her greatest accomplishment is that of making friends too easily. I see. Just who she, is she, anyway? Does she live here? Yeah, she lives here. She is my wife. Your wife? Exactly. My wife. Good night, Mr. Vanier. I stood there in the moonlight and watched him walk toward his bungalow. My simple task was fast becoming involved. When I finally turned in that night, I undressed in the dark, pushed the bed up to block the door and propped a chair against the windowsill, and lay down on the floor. I kept trying to fit some theory together to account for the things that had happened. When I drifted off to sleep, I was no nearer any answer than before. I woke up with the first light of dawn and for a full minute was ready to predict a peaceful day. Then I turned my head slightly and saw it. On the floor, against the wall, 18 inches from my left hand, its eyes opening and unmoving, lay a long tail, one of the deadliest snakes in Borneo. Cold sweat broke out on my forehead, ran to the corners of my eyes. Not... Daring to make any sudden move, I slid my right hand slowly up behind me, found my gun under the pillow. The snake moved slightly, and I froze for one long minute. Carefully, I brought the gun over until I had the ugly head centered above the foresight. Then... Who fired that shot? I did, Kurt, in here. Hey, Kurt, what's all the shooting about? I found out now, Duran, it's Mr. Vanille fired. What's up, Duran? Yeah, what was that noise? I guess Vanille's doing a little target practicing. Come on, guys. Now, just a minute. Just a minute. I'll, I'll let you in. Yeah, there. Mr. Vanille, you all right? Sure, Kurt, come in. I uh, had an early morning visitor. There on the floor. A long tail. Did he bite you? No, no, he didn't. What the devil's all the racket about... Oh, a snake, eh? That's funny. What's funny, Duran? A long tail, Wilmerding. I just killed one here in my room. Huh. Well, there's plenty of them around, but I never heard of one crawling into a room before. I'm not sure it did crawl in. Got an idea it may have been dropped in through the mosquito netting there at the window. Yeah? By who? By a guy named Jerome Steeks. You ever hear of him, Duran? Oh, that again. Why don't you pick up Wilmerding? He's your man. Oh, sure. I always carry a couple of snakes around in my pocket, just for luck. Hey, what I want to know is who carries this around in their pocket, for luck. Hey, that's one of our knives from the living room. We throw them at a target. Yeah, I know. Only last night I was the target. Oh, then Prale's your boy. He's an expert. Wins every time we play. Oh, dry up, Duran. One more crack like that. Okay, I'm... relax. So nobody knows anything about these accidents. They just happen, huh? Well, here's a warning to whichever one of you is Steaks. The next time, you'd better cover yourself. I'm through being a clay pigeon. From now on, it's going to be a lot tougher. A whole lot tougher. That day passed, and the next, and I got exactly nowhere. And the third day, I managed to search the men's quarters and found nothing. Mainly, I'd hoped to find some kind of a bleaching agent. Steaks was described as having black hair while all three of these men were blonde. Furthermore, I was convinced after three days of observation that all three were naturally blonde. Things didn't fit. They didn't add up. 
I saw Nalana several times, but had no chance to speak to her. When Herr Kurt was with me, she'd pass without a glance. But if I was alone, she'd manage a quick, provocative smile that sent shivers down my spine. By the fourth day, the tension among us was grown almost unbearable. The steamer was due the next evening on his return trip to Batavia. I needed a break of some kind, had to have one. And it came at dusk when I dropped in my room to change for dinner. Close the door. Quick, Twan. Speak softly. It is I, Nelana. Nelana, what in the devil are you doing here? To see you, Twan. Does that make you unhappy? No, no, it doesn't. But I doubt if Herr Kurt would think much of the idea. Oh, he must not find out. But I, I wish to ask you something. All right, honey, shoot. It is true that you look for a man who has killed a woman in your United States? Yes, yes, that's right. A man who now names himself by another name? Yes. Nelana, do you know? It is perhaps the same one who one night threw a knife at you? Yes, yes, I think so. You know who it is? I saw the knife thrown to when I was outside by the edge of the... Quiet, quiet. It is someone? Yeah, that's Herr Kurt. He's going in the living room. I'm very frightened, Juan. I must go. No, no, wait. I've got to know what you're going to... There's no time now. Tonight, when everyone sleeps, wait by the towel palm at the edge of the clearing. I will come. All right, I'll be there. Nelana has done foolish things, Tuan. But tonight, she will fix it all good. You come. I waited for a long time in the shadow by the palm tree and watched the moonlight sift down through the shaggy fronds. But two hours passed and she didn't come. Waiting there, though, in the jungle night, a plan began to form in my mind. Long shot, true enough, but one with possibilities. It needed luck to work. But I'd come to the point where I had to count on a little luck. At any rate, I decided to start the ball rolling the next morning after breakfast. Now, wait a minute, Vernier. Let's get this straight. Oh, I thought I put it straight enough to run. I said the hunt's off. The boat's due in tonight, and when it leaves, I go with it. You can relax. Oh? What changed your mind? Our sweet dispositions? <laughs> exactly the opposite, Wilmerding. Every one of you acts as guilty as the next one. And yet, in five days, I haven't been able to find a single characteristic in any of you that fits the description of Steaks. I don't think he's that good an actor. So, I'm going back to Batavia and pick up the trail there. Well... At least you finally got some sense in your head and decided to believe what we told you the first day you were here. Oh, no, no, Duran, I didn't say that. Now, I doubt very much if any of you guys is who he claims to be. I wouldn't be surprised if Duran, Wilmerding, and Prale are all phony names, but that's not my business. Now, I came here after Steaks. I decided now I made a mistake, and that's that. Oh, great. You come in here and push us around for a week and then decide it was all a mistake. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Prale. And I'm going to try to make up for it this evening. See, I'm throwing a dinner party at Herr Kurt's bungalow before the boat leaves tonight. You're all invited. Well, now, that's pretty decent of you, Vernier. Yeah, I'll get some food and drinks from the captain as soon as he docks. <laughs> if you're as fed up with Reistoffel and warm beer as I am, he'll be ready for a change. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm ready for a you, yes. Oh, good, good. Then it's all settled. And I can promise you at least two surprise dishes. Maybe three, if you I care for... I beg your pardon, gentlemen. Oh, oh, Kurt, come in, come in. I was wondering whether any of you had seen Alana this morning. Well, not me. Oh, I haven't. Oh. Why? What's wrong, Hickert? I'm rather concerned about her, Mr. Vanier. She hasn't been home since early last night. I had a couple of ideas about that myself. Ideas I wish I didn't have. As soon as the rest of the bunch went about their business, I began my own search for Nalana. It was nearly dusk before I found her. And then I said nothing about it to anyone. But sitting at the table that night while the dinner party moved along... I kept thinking how she'd never smile again. How she'd never walk in the moonlight again. Because somebody had cut her throat. <laughs> I know a story along the same lines, but I never heard that one before. Oh, what a dinner. <laughs> Boy, after six months on rice stuffle, I could go crazy over food like this. Yeah, when you throw one, Vernier, you really throw it. Ah, no, no, save the credit, boys. This is only the beginning. Beginning? Where can you go from here? Yeah. Well, yeah. right now, for instance, roast bar. Yeah. All right, Wong, bring it over. Bring it over. Right, Mama, it's all right the way I bring Look, Look at that. that. Oh, Would you like me to put here for oh, you to carve, Thomas? No, no, I, um, I wonder if you'd mind carving, Heckert. Not at all, Mr. Veneer. I shall be happy to. Place it here, Wong. 
boy, oh boy, I haven't had roast boar since Australia. You know, we used to go pig sticking all the time. Even the smell's enough to drive you crazy. Man, you said it, Prale. Ah, uh, you haven't seen anything yet. See, the boar's the main dish, so the two surprises go right along with it. Oh. All right, one. Now bring it out. That's all, my sir. Already I bring it yeah, right careful, away now. Careful now, don't drop it. Yeah, thanks. Well, there you are. What is it, some kind of wine? Uh, not some kind. It's Chambertin, vintage 1911. Unquestionably one of the finest red wines that exist in the world today. Holy smoke, where'd you get it? Uh, I found out on the trip in. The captain of the steamer had a few bottles. Took a lot of talking to get one out of him, but uh, here, I'll open it up one. Have you the glasses? Sir, I promise, sir. It's already here on sideboard. Good. Well, boys, you may go back to warm beer tomorrow, but you've got the best tonight. <sighs> All right, Wong. Now, show him the second surprise. Here's one big bucket. Ice! Hey. Real honest to gosh cracked ice. Boy, I haven't oh. seen a chunk of ice for six months. Yeah, I thought you'd go for that one. All right, Wong. Serve the wine. Say it, Mama, sir. Yeah, it was pretty amazing to find 1911 Sambertan in a little tramp freighter down here in the South Pacific. <laughs> Stuff's so rare, it's hard to get at any price. Now. Yeah, maybe so, but that ice is what gets me. Yeah, that's it, Wong. Dump plenty in mine. I want to freeze my tongue. Hey, Wong, stop that. What the devil are you doing? Rumor Ting, what's the matter with Boy, you? Boy, he's... he's bu- I, I, I mean, I... I mean... You mean you're well aware of the fact that ice kills the bouquet of Chambertin? Isn't that it, Steaks? Steaks? You mean Wilmerding is... Once a gourmet, always a gourmet. Now, you were very clever, Wilmerding. Clever enough to keep your hair dyed black for years so you could become a natural blonde if you ever had to make a getaway. Clever enough to permit no photographs to be taken. But not clever enough to keep still and let me ruin a bottle of wine. Easy with those hands. Don't try reaching for a gun. Let him reach for it, Mr. Veneer. Good, no. Put down that knife. Look out, Veneer. He's going for his gun. Good, I warned that. Help you! Good Lord, Cut, you've killed him. I'm sorry you do not have a prisoner to take back with you, Mr. Vanier. But I, too, found Nilana's body. I knew you had been there. I saw your footprints. I'm sorry, Cat. Then yes, she had... Yes, Nilana had been seeing Wilmerding. I'd guessed it was one of the three, and apparently she found out he was Steaks. Yeah, I know. That was what she was going to tell me. Only he didn't give her a chance. She was young, Mr. Vanier. Foolish, perhaps. But I... I loved her very much. Look, he knocked over that bottle of wine when he fell. It's pouring out all over the place. Yeah, brother, what a mess. Yeah, Duran. It's quite a mess. Only one thing, though. Not all of it is red wine. Escape was directed this week by Richard Sandville, and tonight brought you Red Wine by L.G. Blockman, adapted for radio by Mort Lewis and Les Crutchfield, with Willard Waterman as Paul Vernier. Featured players were Robert Boone, Marion Richman, Larry Dobkin, Vic Perrin, Wilms Herbert, and Clark Gordon. Music is conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Next week, you are standing at the doorway of a cabin on Cashier Creek. Up on the ridge, the bloodhounds have caught your scent. And between you and a fortune, between you and escape, yawn the white jaws of a deadly snake, a cottonmouth moccasin. Next week, we escape with Irvin S. Cobb's ironic story, Snake Doctor. Be with us next week at this same time when once again we offer you Escape, Tip Corning speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.